Hello, everybody. My name is Rick Bidlack. I'm a software development engineer at Wheatstone Corporation. The broadcast industry is going through a tough transitional phase right now. It has been for uh, the past decade or so as on air radio frequency listeners um, are decreasing in number and streaming listeners are increasing. Um, so this, this is a, a whole change of technology. It's a whole change of practice. It's a change of uh, revenue stream. It changes everything. It's a sea change in the industry. And, and what's happened is that you have now a lot of um, very div uh, experienced and knowledgeable engineers that are faced with a, uh, a brand new world, a brand new body of knowledge that they don't know much about. And so that is what has prompted this particular presentation. Uh, I want to talk about uh, just the basics of streaming, uh, why we do it, how we do it, what are the big pieces in the puzzle. So we'll start off by showing um, the, the traditional broadcast signal flow. Um, this is a very rough view, of course. Um, we start with the, the audio input, uh, which is usually an automation system. It can include the microphones in the studio as well, of course, uh, incoming phone calls, things like that. But there's your audio source. If it's an automation system, then um, it also is the supplier of metadata, which is to say information about the songs that are being played. Um, the titles, the, the bands, the albums, the ISRC numbers, things like that. All of that information is included in metadata. Metadata also includes things like um, ads, sweepers, liners, uh, things of that nature, things which are not songs. Um, so the automation system is pumping out both audio and metadata. This is being received by the HDFM processor. The audio um, goes into the multiplex uh, signal and it also goes to the HD signal. The metadata is turned into RDS on the one hand, which is part of the MPX signal uh, for the FM. And it's, it, then it's turned into artist experience data for the HD signal. Both of these, as part of the same spectrum, go to the transmitter. The transmitter then broadcasts that to all the listeners uh, who have radios. And they are receiving this, and they can see the RDS data, and they can also see the artist experience data if they're tuned into the HD part of the uh, signal. So with streaming, uh, with, with the streaming signal chain, we start at the same place. We still have an automation system, um, which has metadata. Both of these are now going to the stream encoder. Um, the stream encoder is also called an origin server um, from the viewpoint of the CDN. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the CDN is the content distribution network. So the CDN is basically um, a bunch of servers out there in the cloud. Every CDN has their own servers. They're located in different uh, geographical places around the country, around the world, in fact. Um, these are very powerful servers with very good internet connections. They're able to serve streams to thousands or even tens of thousands of listeners out there. So basically, um, in this, in this scenario, the stream encoder is taking the place of the FM processor. The CDN is taking the place of the transmitter. The stream encoder has three basic jobs that it has to do. First is that it has to process and condition the audio in order to optimize it for the compression algorithms. We're, we're going to be doing data compression on the audio in order to reduce the bandwidth, which has to go out over the network. After the processing, it encodes the audio. Uh, we'll be encoding into usually AAC, but also uh, MP3 or even Opus are used. It has to be encoded that way. It needs to be packetized. 
meaning putting it into smaller packets, chunks of uh, chunk size packets, which are then transmitted via TCP IP over the public internet to the CDN. And the third job concerns metadata. The, the stream encoder accepts metadata coming in and it then has to reformat that metadata in order to pass it up to the CDN. The reason for that is that the CDN does not accept metadata in the format that the automation system produces it. Unlike a transmitter tower, a CDN actually provides a lot of add-on services. So one of the biggest is that they can replace the, the spots, the advertisements that are in the, in the audio stream, in the original audio stream. So if you are in um, Peoria, Illinois, and you have an ad for the local hardware store, um, that's not gonna mean a lot to uh, the listener in Boston uh, who would rather hear another ad for a different hardware store, perhaps. So that's what ad replacement is. Geoblocking is, um, is where um, certain, for example, games, baseball game is not allowed to be shown in the city uh, are not allowed to be heard in the city um, where the game is being played, as an example, or an ad that should not be heard somewhere outside of a particular geographical region. Um, so geoblocking accomplishes that. Um, logging and skimming are services that uh, have traditionally be done, been done in the radio station itself, but uh, it's something that the CDN can very easily do. Um, they can also provide a really nice service, which is uh, catch-up recording and playback. So in other words, your show is being recorded the entire time, and it can then be chopped up into you know, 20 or 30-minute segments, and the, um, and the CDN can allow uh, listeners to catch your show at a later time. Um, the CDN, because it is receiving all of the um, all of your stream and it knows who's listening to it, it can give you statistics on who's listening, what they're listening to, how long, where they are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the CDN can also transcode formats so they can change bit rates on your stream. They can uh, they can take things like an icecast stream and turn it into a um, a, uh, a multivariant HLS stream. We'll talk about those later on. Um, so uh, some nice technical services that they provide. And they can also provide, finally, um, more information about uh, the, the music that's being played. So for example, they can add URLs for uh, a store, a fan a fan club store, uh, album art, uh, any other kinds of uh, services that, um, that might be provided. So let's take a look, a closer look at the um, inner workings of the stream encoder. On the left side, we have our audio coming in. We have full bandwidth audio coming in. The first thing we're going to do is run it through a digital signal processing algorithm in order to condition it, clean it up, get it ready for the data compression encoder, which is the next step after this. The reason we do this is that the, the data has to be compressed and you have a limited number of bits that you, can, that you can throw at that data. Or to put it another way, the compression encoder has to spend bits and you want it to spend those bits on signal that matters and not signal that doesn't matter. Um, artifacts that you are not going to hear sh shouldn't have bits being devoted to them because you have limited bandwidth. Bandwidth is the number of bits per second that you can actually transmit. More importantly, it's the number of bits per second that the listener can receive on what is often um, a low bandwidth device or in a low bandwidth setting. So the DSP algorithm 
um, can first of all convert the, the stereo signal into mono if desired. That's, a, that's an option. You don't have to do that for streaming. You can add EQ, you can add AGC to keep the signal um, consistent and level, high enough and not too loud. And then a final limiter to uh, just keep it nice and, and tight there. After that, um, it goes to a data compression encoder. The most popular format for uh, data compression today is AAC. MP3, AAC has replaced MP3. MP3 is still popular. Opus is a, um, is a free encoder, which sounds wonderful, but unfortunately is not uh, supported by all players out there in the streaming world. So the, uh, the output of the encoder, which is now uh, a compressed signal, is then packetized. Um, probably the three most popular formats for packetizing and sending a stream today are IceCast, RTMP, which is the original Adobe Flash format. Now Flash has been obsoleted at this point, but RTMP as a protocol still uh, is still used widely. And uh, a new format, uh, well, relatively new, uh, which was invented by Apple, although based on earlier formats, of course, uh, HTTP live streaming, otherwise known as HLS. HLS is um, interesting because you can have multiple variants of a stream being um, broadcast or streamed, transmitted simultaneously. And the reason you would do that, it's for adaptive streaming purposes. If you have a, a listener who's mobile, so they're on a smartphone and they are walking around, Sometimes they're going to be in an area where they have a lot of bandwidth and they can hear a higher bandwidth um, stream. They, can, they have the bandwidth to, to, to uh, receive that. Um, and of course that improves the quality of the, of the audio. But if they're in an area where um, the bandwidth is very low, then the HLS adaptive stream will automatically switch down to a lower bandwidth variant of the stream. So that's the whole point of HLS. There is another format called RTP, real-time protocol. This is not often used for commercial streaming. It's most often used for studio to studio links and studio to transmitter links. Um, However, RTP is very widely used in the industry. It, it is the basis for AES-67. It's the basis for um, Wheatstone's Wheatnet. Uh, it's the basis for uh, Axia Livewire. It's the, those are all variations of RTP streams. At the same time that the audio is being um, processed and compressed and packetized, the metadata is coming in as well. The metadata that comes in cannot be used directly by the CDN. The CDN would not recognize it, wouldn't know what to do with it. Therefore, the metadata has to be transformed into some format that the CDN understands. And for this reason, we use transformation filters, which are often written in a language called Lua, which is an embedded language, which is uh, easy to program. Um, it's easy to understand the protocol and to make changes. And um, so basically, it's capable of transforming any kind of input, which is what you have in terms of metadata coming in, to any kind of output, which is what you have to be ready for because you don't know what the CDN is going to want in terms of um, of the format of that metadata. Every CDN is going to have their own requirements for how the metadata is to be formatted. So this is the purpose of the transform filter. Metadata is handed off to the CDN in various methods. So with IceCast, it's normally transmitted as, an, as a separate HTTP message out of band, meaning it's not part of the audio um, stream, which is going up to the IceCast server. It might be going to the same server as the server which is accepting audio, or it may actually be going to a different server. That's 
With RTMP, the metadata is, is actually embedded into the audio stream uh, in a separate packet called a set data frame packet. With HLS, um, the metadata can be embedded in, in band in the stream itself um, uh, in the form of ID3 tags. It can also be embedded in the manifest, in the manifest file as a SCUDI35 message for ad replacement. So SCUDI35 messages are, are already being used in, in, for example, broadcast television to signal ad replacement opportunities, as they call them, where you would begin to put in an ad and where that opportunity ends. Uh, MPEG Dash is a, uh, a predecessor to HLS. They're quite similar. Um, RTP is uh, an exception. Uh, there's no native methods to carry metadata in RTP, although the, the specification does not uh, forbid it by any means. You can, you can invent your own um, data type um, in RTP uh, called a payload type and, uh, and carry metadata that way. You can also carry metadata if you're just going from site to site within an organization. And as long as the receiver knows what to expect, you can embed metadata in any, any manner that you wish. So let's take a look at some metadata, what it actually looks like. Um, sometimes it's uh, in the form of simple tagged text, what we call tagged text. Um, so where the tag means something like artist equals or title equals or length equals, or sometimes you'll see duration equals. So that's called the tag. And so it's a particular sequence of alphanumeric characters followed by a equal sign or a colon or what have you. And then everything after that tag up until the new line is the actual information. So that's a simple example. Let's look at a, uh, a more involved example. So here we're looking at um, metadata, which has been formatted as XML or almost XML. And in, in this case, we have a tag for each item of metadata that is in here. So uh, if you go down to, for example, the second line, you'll see title, the sky is a neighborhood, the artist is the Foo Fighters. Then you go down a little bit further, um, we see a station identification, 93.5 HD1. Um, down on the, what is that? The sixth line, we see that this is a song, a media type is song. Um, down below that, um, we see the album, we see, I don't see it. Oh, here's a duration on uh, line five. In this case, 243.3 seconds is what's meant here. In other words, 243,300 milliseconds is the duration in this case. Let's take a look at a Another example, uh, this is uh, from a different automation machine. So the format is slightly different. Um, notice that this one has an HTML entity. It's that ampersand between Hall and Oats. That, for example, is something that the CDN is not going to want to see and is not going to be able to display very well. And so we're going to have to do something about that, meaning our transform filter is going to have to do something about that. It has to recognize HTML entities and replace them with actual characters. Here is, uh, here's an example of a station ID. So this is, uh, in this case, an 11 second station ID. Um, notice that the artist field is empty. Uh, this has been given a type of, a type called link which is a catch-all term for all kinds of different things. Anything that isn't an ad or a song might be a link. Um, notice that the length in this case is no longer in milliseconds, but in actual hours, minutes, and seconds. So in other words, 
format of uh, format of the metadata can change quite drastically depending on where it's coming from. So here is another example uh, from the same automation system. In this case, it's a liner. They call it a voice track. Again, the artist field is empty. This one's very short, just six seconds. Another example of the kinds of things that you might see coming from an automation system. Here, here's a, another example of our metadata from the second automation system that we were looking at. Uh, in this case, uh, it's a sweeper. Uh, we know that because of what we see on the second and third line, CYQ, tone, quick sweep, number 12. This one has a media type, which is called unspecified. Okay, so that'll be a clue for, that'll be a clue for the transform filter when it sees it about what to do with this. Is it something that, is it a, is it a song? No, it's not a song. Is it an ad? No, it's not. It's, a, well, it's unspecified. So it means we'll pass it on, but there's not gonna be any ad triggers associated with this, for example. There's a very good chance that none of this metadata that gets passed on to the CDN will actually be displayed in any way, shape or form. Here's an example of uh, an actual commercial, uh, a spot. Um, in this case, uh, Westfield Merchants in June. And we see uh, down on the third line from the bottom, the media type here is spot. So that's going to be an important uh, item of information to pass on to the CDN because this commercial might get replaced with a different commercial once it's actually being streamed from the CDN. So given the metadata examples that we've seen, uh, let's take a look at how these get reformatted in order to be passed on to the CDN. At the top, this is a typical example of what you would pass on to an IceCast server. This is typical IceCast format. Um, so, we so it's an HTTP message. It's directed, you, you have a, a username and password at the beginning, so the, your, your auth, authentication, then you've got the URL, and then you've got a continuation. In this case, it goes to an admin location, and it's telling it that it's a metadata update, and there's the information, the Foo Fighters in this case, the sky is a neighborhood, the original duration of 243 seconds is now, has now been converted into our minute second format. And the final piece of information there is that it is a song. Now let's look at the one below it. It looks very similar, same fields. The, the first field after song equals is actually empty because in this case, there is no artist involved in this one. There is a title, shop local Westfield merchants, but there's no artist involved. So that field is left empty. Uh, and then we see in the duration, this is a 30 second commercial. So it ends with calm. So in this case, calm is an ad trigger to the CDN. Here is, uh, here's the same, same piece of, uh, of metadata uh, from the Foo Fighters now being sent in, in an RTMP stream. Uh, this is uh, formatted now as a set data frame message. It doesn't actually go like this over the wire. It's, um, it's put into a packet, but this is the, the crucial information which is in that packet. Typically with RTMP set data frame messages, you have a title and artist, and then you have a URL, and the URL carries everything else um, that you want to send. So there's an auto ID, there's an auto cat, tell, identifying this as a song. Um, we see um, an album information, we see the label, RCA, we see an ISRC number. The information we send in the URL field is determined by the CDN. They will ask for certain things. 
um, that they use in their own um, statistics and their own um, you know, added services, uh, various triggers, things like that. Um, here's an example of metadata from the real world. The artist here, <laughs> if we look at her name, it looks a little bit mangled, doesn't it? Um, as humans, we can tell that this is supposed to be Beyonce, but the poor computers involved in all of this process don't know that. And in fact, they're not able to make the switch. These, these funny characters, the last three characters uh, uh, after the C in Beyonce's name are what we call the the Unicode replacement character or the wildcard character. And the reason this is here is because uh, back in the day, someone was entering metadata into this automation system and typed in an E with an accent, and that was not recognized. The software that was handling that did not know what to do with it, and it replaced it with a Unicode FFFD, which uh, when printed sometimes comes out as this uh, funny sequence of the I with the diuresis, the upside down question mark, the one half. Um, sometimes you'll see this printed as a, uh, the, the lozenge question mark, the black lozenge question mark. So that simply means it's a character that's unrecognized and we don't know what to do with it. This is the purpose of metadata cleaners or aggregators as they're called. In these slides uh, that you've seen previously, uh, I was showing that the metadata was basically going from the automation system directly into the FM processor or the stream encoder. In fact, many times it goes to a metadata aggregator. And the purpose of that is to ensure consistency and correct spelling of all of the metadata that um, passes through, um, through the station and onto the stream, one to RDS. Um, so the, the metadata aggregator would, would see this and say, no, they really mean Beyonce, and here's the correct spelling, and, uh, and by the way, the in in Crazy in Love should be capitalized, so you know, it just does all those things. And oh, by the way, the song is actually 3 minutes and 57 seconds, not 3.56, and so it makes those corrections. Hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Uh, as always, you can reach me at rick at wheatstone.com. It's been a pleasure talking to you. This is Rick Bidlock at Wheatstone signing off, and we'll see you next time.